Thailand is a country that's sort of a peaceful oasis, surrounded by a very turbulent part of the world. Thailand's neighbors are Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Burma. Our only real friendly neighbor is Malaysia to the south. For a while they called Thailand Siam, but they changed the name back to Thailand because in their language the word Thai means free. They wanted to give a clear message to the turbulent world surrounding them that Thailand would always remain free. In the Golden Triangle to the north, more than 85% of Asia's opium is grown every year. There's a tropical paradise in the south and in the middle, some of the most beautiful and exciting people you've ever seen. It may be the most exotic country in Asia. This is where we're going to be visiting. Have you ever seen a jet engine fall apart before? That's just the way they stop. Quite a shot through the window that first time, though. In the southern Malay Peninsula, there were many rubber plantations. This is Thailand's southern border. A very relaxed place, considering the part of the world we're driving through. They did have one vicious watchdog here. A couple of guards casually checking everybody's luggage. The most common and popular way to travel around Bangkok is on the little tuk-tuks. That's a tuk-tuk. Gets its name from the noise that it makes. Certainly not the only way to get around Bangkok, though. For instance, there is no such thing as too many on a motorcycle in this city. I met this British guy on the train who suggested a very inexpensive hotel called the Malaysia. On the way, he told me the story of this place. He said back during the Vietnam War, Bangkok was one of the favorite cities in Southeast Asia for R&R, for the American troops, rest and recuperation. Well, many hotels like the Malaysia sprung up specifically for that purpose. The Malaysia was about $15 a night, which easily fit into the GI budget, and it was designed for the young soldiers on leave. Many of the windows and terraces were situated directly over the swimming pool, so if a young GI had a little bit too much to drink during a party and fell overboard, he had a good chance of landing in the pool. The problem is, when we pulled out of this war almost overnight, we left the economy here in quite a bind, especially for these hotels. They were too expensive for the backpacking overlanders, and they weren't fancy enough for the intercontinental crowd. Financially, they were sort of stuck in the middle. Well, to survive, they just cut their room rates in half to accommodate the backpackers. We're going to climb on a Mercedes-Benz tour bus now for a trip to the Northwest. The tour buses in Thailand were about the most luxurious I've ever seen. They were more like first-class plane trips than bus rides. Music of your choice piped through, air conditioning of course, cocktails served on board. The little brown bottle that the conductor is drinking contains a stimulant. The conductor and driver will drink these little bottles and drive wide awake all night long. I found the best place on the bus to sit was not in the front seat, where you can see where you're going. They have interesting drivers here, to say the least. Notice that they can't really see where they're going when they blindly pull out into oncoming traffic like that. They just pull right out anyway. They don't always get away with it. Now the best thing to do is to sit somewhere in the back of the bus, have a cocktail, and have them tell you when you get there. We're on a night bus now, heading north to the oldest capital in Thailand, the ancient city of Chiang Mai. That driver will drink that little bottle and drive wide-eyed all night long. Chiang Mai is near the border of Burma and Laos in Thailand. From here you can hire guides to take you up into the mountains to visit the fascinating mountain tribes. As soon as you enter Chiang Mai, you feel as though you've gone back in a time machine. There's a moat around the oldest part of the city. Also, in Chiang Mai and these other northern cities are where Thailand's most beautiful ladies are supposed to come from. Most of these Southeast Asian countries have an area that they claim produce their prettiest ladies. Thailand, they say it's in the north. I really couldn't argue. When the Chinese were spreading out through this part of the world, fleeing the hordes of Kublai Khan, everywhere they went, they left their culture and their architecture. The elephants are here to hold everything up. They provide strength and stability. And the serpent is here for the purpose of protection. Serpents are supposed to keep the evil ones away. So at either side of the entrance to every temple you will find the statue of the serpent. He's there to protect the ones inside worshiping and to prevent the evil ones from entering. A 
As you can see here, the serpent has almost been destroyed by the elements. But that bronze Buddha up there is still completely intact, almost 2,000 years old. We're heading north again. This time we're going all the way to the borders between Thailand and Burma. The last village we came to in Thailand was a little village of Fang. When we entered Fang, we saw this celebration going on. Music and dance is such an integral part of their culture that you can usually find celebrations like this going on almost anywhere at any time. Well, Fang again is where the roads end and the river adventure can begin. Remember that bamboo footbridge in the background. It's going to change later. We had to hire a long tail boat to take us about five miles up river to where the five day hike would begin. Very friendly, peaceful place that day. But one month earlier, none of these tourists would have been here. It was much too dangerous. I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. But for right now, the only problem seemed to be our very overloaded boat and this very shallow river. Even with one boatman on the front of the boat to try and find the deeper part of the channel, we kept getting stuck on sandbars but they would just throw that motor in reverse and pull us off. These rivers rise and fall so much every year that most of the people who live on the shores have to move their houses frequently. Fortunately, their houses don't take long to build. We seem to be doing pretty well negotiating this hazardous bottom until we got right about here. We hit that log on the bottom, poked a hole in our boat. A couple of us noticed that we were leaking and sinking. The boatman said, no problem, we'll fix that. You all walk up on shore there now, watch out for the water snakes. The local kids got quite a kick out of this. They told us that our boat was too big for their river at this time of year. They patched that leak pretty quickly though. They got a piece of rawhide woven together with some other type of fabric, poked it down into the hole, the leather expanded with the water, plugged the leak. In no time at all, we were underway again. The river began to get narrower now. I realized we were getting near the place where the comfortable boat ride was going to end and the five-day hike would begin. The first two days would be all uphill. One place I found this beautiful little temple right in the jungle. I wondered how they got the material up there to build it with no roads. Well, it's time to start hiking. It's also time to introduce you to our guide. His name is Jungle Johnny. There he is. He works for the Jungle Johnny Tour Guide Company. Quite a few years earlier, the original Jungle Johnny and another guide named Mr. Moo brought tourists up here for the first time. But they weren't welcomed by the mountain people. On the contrary, they were chased out. Then Jungle Johnny and Mr. Moo came up here by themselves and made deals with all of the mountain tribes. Whereby if the tribes would give the tourists a place to stay for the night, maybe an evening meal, they'd get a little bit of a financial kickback from the company. Well, like most people in this part of the world, the mountain people are very poor, so they took the offer. They didn't change their ways, though. Mountain people rarely do. The only difference is that now we were welcome. These bamboo water troughs will bring fresh water for long distances alongside the trail down to the village, keeping the water up off the ground and therefore clean. We're in a Lee Sioux village. This is where we're going to spend the night. We fell asleep that night, listening to the water gurgling along in the water trough over our heads. And the next morning, we woke up to one of the most hauntingly beautiful sights I had ever seen. This was the valley that we had hiked through the afternoon before. They said that fog comes in every morning, makes it look like a primeval forest. Life begins very early in Elisu village. The children are at first. They dress this way every morning. It's part of their culture. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of kids that I want you to try to remember. 
There she is. She's three years old, and her big sister's a teenager. We're going to see that little one again later, so remember her face if you can. Well, we walked uphill all day long the next day, through one village after another. Most of the villages were deserted, except for the livestock. But that was okay, because the livestock was usually very entertaining. They had watch dogs everywhere, even a few watch geese. That's a watch goose. The dogs were really pretty mean. Every time we would enter a village, Johnny would pick up a stick to keep the dogs away. You don't want to try to pet the dogs in the mountains of Thailand. This device was for the purpose of grinding grain. We're in the highest part of the mountain now, where the Aka tribe lives. Some of the most primitive and interesting people up here. We're also in an area now known to the world as the Golden Triangle. This is where 80% of Asia's opium is grown every year. That's why it was too dangerous up here last month. That was the middle of harvest season. As you can see, most of the petals have fallen off the poppies now, and there won't be another harvest for another year. Johnny told me that even though it was very dangerous last month, he said I should have seen it. It was beautiful also. With all the poppies blooming, it looked as though a plane had flown over these mountains and dropped paint. Most opium poppies are white, but they also come in pink, orange, red. Well, I decided right then that someday I was going to have to return here in January or February to film that story. I had no idea at that time what a dangerous situation that was going to create three years later. The actual spot known as the Golden Triangle is where the Mekong River forks. The forking of the river provides the border for these three countries. We're standing on Thailand looking at a little bit of Burma, and directly across the river was Laos. Well, since these three countries have always touched borders here, the opium mercenaries have also come together here to buy and sell their illegal crop. But since they came from three different countries, they couldn't use the same currency or money. They had to use gold in their transactions. That's how we get the name, the Golden Triangle. And the Golden Triangle was going to provide quite an adventure three years later. When I first visited Thailand, I saw that country from north to south, east to west. There were cobras, crocodiles, the bridge in the river Kwai. Interesting stories all over this country. But the story that interested me the most was in an area of northern Thailand called the Golden Triangle. This is where 80% of Asia's opium is grown every year. It's also where the borders of Thailand, Laos, and Burma all come together. The first time I visited the Golden Triangle was in March, one month after the opium harvest that year had ended. The danger was over for the year, but so was the interesting story. I returned three years later to capture that story on film, which is what we're going to see now. But first, we're going to have to stop off in the capital city of the Philippines, Manila, to meet a very interesting gentleman named Easy Black. Easy Black seems to have jumped out of the pages of an Ernest Hemingway novel. They're off the screen in one of those old 1940s movies. He's an American who spent enough time in Southeast Asia to really learn his way around. When I had first met Easy three years ago, he was running a little restaurant called Andy Caps Inn, a very colorful little place, and I was doing a water sports project for the Philippine Department of Tourism. Well, now three years later, Easy had managed to find me an underwater film job in southern Thailand, which was going to pay for this return trip. So let's be on our way. As I mentioned, Easy Black is right out of a Humphrey Bogart movie. Three years earlier, he had owned a little restaurant called Andy Caps Inn. Now he was the manager of the Playboy Club. I had to find Easy because he had arranged for an underwater cinematography job in Thailand, which was going to pay for this return trip. So I found him at the club to get the details. Easy quit work earlier that day because the first typhoon of the season was going to strike. In honor of this occasion, Easy was having a typhoon party. Many people in this part of the world do that on the first typhoon of the season, since nobody can leave the party during the typhoon. Well, we were all waiting for the typhoon to approach across Manila Bay. There's Easy's little girl. Last time I had seen her, she had only been three years old. Now she was seven, growing up into a pretty little girl. We were all waiting for the typhoon to approach, and Easy was going over his tropical butterfly collection with his daughter and her friends. He told me that the underwater film job was all set, but this was not a year to go back to the mountains. He didn't have any of the details, but he told me that it was much more dangerous this year than it had been in previous years. I said, Easy, I've spent a lot of time and money to come back. I just can't turn around and go home. He said, okay, but if I was convinced that I should be very careful and watch my back. Well, when somebody like Easy Black tells you something like that in Southeast Asia, you want to heed the warning. 
Typhoon was getting very close. Now you can usually see them approaching. They look like a wall of water, and when they hit, they hit like a hammer. It's a good thing that Easy lived in a strong building. The cinder winds that night were 130 miles an hour. Of course, a lot of wind and rain do nothing to curtail a typhoon party. If anything, they add to it. Late at night, they turn into lightning and thunderstorms. By the next morning, the skies had cleared, but this storm had left its mark on the streets of Manila. This kind of flood would probably paralyze most of the cities in the world. Here, they barely seemed to even notice that their capital was underwater. I saw as much traffic on the street this day as I had seen before the storm. This was the day to take off for Bangkok first. I went by Easy's house one more time to say goodbye to everybody. This is what I carry with me on tour, 50 100-foot rolls of 16-millimeter movie film. This box was going to cause a lot of trouble pretty soon, so it's going to become part of the story now. I had a repair job to do that night. This is an underwater camera housing. It had been damaged by being thrown off the airplane that day. Many can relate to that with their luggage, but this little glass box was going to pay for this trip home, so it needed repairs that night. I caught a night bus south. By early the next morning, I was in Pattaya. This was the view from my terrace in my hotel room, $7 a night breakfast included. Prices like that are not unusual in this part of the world. It's a very inexpensive place. Any type of water sport you were looking for, you could find it in Pattaya. You could rent these little jet skis for about $5 an hour. They also had big game fishing, scuba diving, water skiing. But I had been hired to film the underwater world. And the underwater world in Pattaya spoke for itself. This is a coral reef a giant underwater living mountain. Not only the fish on the reef, but the reef itself is actually alive. And the fish that you find on the coral reefs of the world are the most colorful anywhere. This particular fish is called a Moorish idol and Moorish idols like to pose for photographers. This is a clownfish. Clownfish have a fascinating symbiotic relationship with a sea anemone. Now that anemone, which looks like a big flower, can sting, but the little clownfish are immune to the stings, so they have a safe place to live and they attract food to their anemone. These two creatures need each other. There are many symbiotic relationships in the sea. It's a good thing that diver's wearing a glove because he's holding on to a piece of fire coral with that hand. Without a glove, you can get quite a chemical burn that way. Well, the underwater world in Pattaya was well worth filming. Well, it wasn't the only water sport here. They did something in Pattaya that I had always wanted to try. Never thought I'd get a chance in Southeast Asia, parasailing. It's actually very easy to do, unless you want to do aerobatics like these two. If you just want to do it the normal way, they harness you into a parachute as you're standing on the beach. The boatman hits the power, you take two steps off the sand, and you're airborne. Now I'm safely harnessed into this parachute here. Both of my hands are free to work the camera. All I had to do was to hang back here, film, and dangle. I found that by pulling on the left strap, I could fly to the left, and by pulling on the right strap, I could fly to the right. So while my boatman weaved his way between the yachts below, I could actually fly over the top of them. I found that it was wise to not try to fly over a boat that had a mast that was too tall. I've discovered in this work that the world is full of practical jokers. Now, these boatmen knew that I was carrying a very expensive movie camera, but they told me earlier that I wouldn't have had the whole experience if they hadn't dunked me at least once. Not far enough to get the camera wet, though. Just enough to rattle me a bit. Landing was quite an adventure also. The tide had come in, making the beach very narrow, and we all seemed to be landing at the same time they could drop us on a dime and other guys were waiting down there to catch me when I landed.
this is really much safer than jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. When you do that, you really come down pretty fast, but these guys could bring us down like feathers. It was lucky that this last guy landed when he did. A few minutes later, the wind came up. It would have been very difficult to land then. Well, I caught a night bus back to Bangkok that evening. Before going to the mountains, I wanted to film some more classical dance and some more kickboxing. So after arriving back in the capital, the first place I went was out to the fights. I met an interesting guy sitting next to me at the fight that evening. His name was Ron. He was a photojournalist from San Francisco, and he was over here looking for a magazine story. When he found out that I knew something of Thailand, he asked me about this country. I told him that if he wanted to come across the street while I filmed the classical dancers, I would tell him what I knew of Thailand. Well, Ron was traveling with a couple of Navy guys that night. They didn't want to see the dances, so they told us they'd catch up with us later. Well, I told Ron about the tropical paradise in the south, the mountains in the north. But the more I talked to Ron, the more I realized that he was really looking for an adventure story. And to be honest, the things that Easy Black had told me about the mountains this year had made me very uneasy. I didn't really like the idea of going up there by myself. I thought maybe in Ron I had a partner. I was honest with him. I told him that it would be dangerous this year because of the opium harvest. But I also told him that I couldn't imagine him finding a more exciting magazine story, not in this part of the world. I have to admit I was embellishing the North, trying to make it sound more interesting than the South. But it wasn't until I told Ron that Thailand's most beautiful ladies also are supposed to come from the North that he really began to get interested. Soon a group of mountain girls came on stage in their traditional costumes, started to dance. Ron had a chance to see a couple of them close up. He decided I was probably telling the truth about their beauty, and he was convinced. The next day we would be on a bus bound for Chiang Mai. About that time, Ron's Navy friends caught up with us. They told us that we couldn't go back to our hotel that night until first we came across town to see their favorite part of Bangkok. If you ever travel with the Navy, you'll spend a little bit of time in this part of town. The next day we were headed north on a bus for Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai hadn't changed too much in the last three years. Rickshaws had turned into trishaws. They added a bicycle to the front, sort of safe on the shoe leather. Well, I rented a couple of trishaws to give Ron his first tour of Chiang Mai. There he is, sort of wondering what I had gotten him into by now. I told our trishaw driver that I wanted to see every temple here. He said, every what? I said, that's right. He said, well, he was a good Buddhist. He'd be doing a lot of praying that day. While he was praying, Ron was photographing everything, and I was interviewing guides. Three years earlier, I had paid a guide $35 for a five-day hike in these mountains. Now I was offering over $200 for the same hike. I couldn't get anybody to even consider it. They all said, much too dangerous this time of year. But then one guide that I talked to at lunchtime came back around dinner time and took the job. He warned me again about the danger, but he said he was a student working his way through school and he needed the money. He also told me that he was going to have to hire a Lisu tribesman because he didn't speak the mountain languages. My new guide needed a guide. We stayed in the nicest hotel I could find in Chiang Mai that evening. I figured we'd be in bamboo huts on dirt floors for the next week or so, so we deserved this place at least one night. Our hotel room came with a fully stocked little bar. While I was packing for the mountain trip, I noticed that Ron was packing the bar. I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, we're going up in the mountains and it's going to get cold up there. I said, Ron, this is the tropics. It doesn't get cold here. He told me to give him a minute and he'd think of a better reason. The guy all dressed in white is our new guide, Palm. And we're heading for the same place where we began this hike three years ago. You remember this place? Probably not. Do you remember that bamboo footbridge? It's not bamboo anymore. There's been some building here. Now you might remember all the tourists that were here last time. Well, the only people here today were a couple of Thais building bamboo rafts to carry cargo downstream. But by talking to these guys, I found out what Easy Black had been so worried about. He hadn't heard the whole story, though. It seemed that there had been a seven-year drought here. Well, because of the lack of rainfall, the opium bandits thought that they were losing money, not being able to grow enough opium. So this year they decided to plant more of the mountain than they had ever planted before, which they did. But then the rains came, ending the drought, causing a bumper crop. So big a crop that nobody had enough soldiers to guard their opium. So the warlords were all stealing it from each other, causing the opium war. They still talk about the opium war that year. 
right now, Ron and I were walking right into the middle of it, unaware. Actually, we were a couple of the lucky ones. A few other Westerners never did return that year, so they closed these mountains in January and February. Ours was one of the last boatloads that were allowed up there at that time of year. different group of tourists on board this time also. There were no women along at all, and none of the men wanted to look into the camera or talk about their business. As soon as we landed, everybody took off in different directions. The signs were now in Thai and Burmese because of the many refugees that have fled across the borders for the sanctuary of Thailand. More guns here than before. They called my new guide Banana Palm because he always carries a bunch of bananas with him. All the mountain kids know when he's coming. They all come out to get their banana from Palm. One of the ways that the mountain guides keep their welcome warm up here with the mountain people. We were on our way to the same Lisu village where we had spent the first night three years ago. Early tomorrow morning, our Lisu guide would join us there and continue on with us. going to reintroduce you to somebody that you've already met. You remember her? Three years ago, she'd only been three years old. Now she's seven, growing up into a pretty little girl, and she has a baby sister of her own, and she remembered us. It was amazing to me how the people could remember us here over the years. The children here become very responsible at a very young age. They have to. Life in the mountains is very rugged. So as soon as possible, you put your babies in charge of your babies. You have your three-year-old taking care of your one-year-old. I fell asleep that night listening to the water gurgling along in the water trough overhead. And early the next morning, woke up to that same hauntingly beautiful sight of three years ago. Our Lee Su guide arrived with the sunrise. I couldn't pronounce his name, so I'm going to call him Lee Su, the name of his tribe. He was 16 years old, and as we walked through the mountains, Lee Su sang a jungle song. <laughs> we walked uphill all day long that day. If you look carefully, you can see the village down in the valley where we spent last night. The more I got to know my new guide, the more I liked him. He couldn't speak any English, but I could talk to him through Palm. And every time we would enter a village, Lee Su would immediately locate and start flirting with the mountain girls. He would tell them that he was working for an American movie maker and I was paying him a whole lot of money. He'd be coming back through here in a few days rich. He'd walk away and they'd be swooning. Lisu sang that song constantly. I asked Palm why, and Palm said, well, the Lisu people believe that they have to sing to everything along the trail just to sort of bless our journey. I'd heard this kind of thing before, but then I would hear him sing the song, he'd stop, somebody off in the distance would sing the same song, then he'd sing it again. I said, Palm, you're not telling me the whole story here. What's really going on? Palm said that he had told me the truth, but these days it means something else also. He said, these people belong on these trails, and this is opium season. As long as he's walking with us and singing that song, we're not likely to walk around a corner and get shot. After that, I was very happy that Lee Su kept singing the song. Little shelters like this were built alongside the trail, usually near some running water, a place to get out of the hot sun for a while. Well, we had been walking all morning long, so I thought we'd stay here for at least 15 or 20 minutes to rest. But that was not to be the case. We had no sooner arrived when a group of mountain girls came up the trail and set up camp in the shelter next to ours. Lee Su's eyes were as big as saucers. I guess the ladies weren't as tired as we were because they were only there for a few minutes. They took up and left. Before Ron and I could even say anything, our two guides were following him. 
Our only choice was to follow everybody or stay behind. Everybody stopped again a few minutes later, though, and we had a chance to see who had caught their eye. When we saw her, we really couldn't blame them. Yeah, at least it was in love. He carried everything she had all the way to the Burmese border. Things began to get very tense now. We had arrived near the border between Thailand and Burma. Once we cross that border, we give up protection from anything like a visa or a passport because it's not legal to travel overland in Burma. But the word legal up here has a very loose meaning. This fence is the only border between these two countries. Once we cross this fence, we're at the mercy of the only authorities up here, the opium warlords and their mercenary armies. Part of what my $200 had bought, though, was the right to be Lee Su's older brother's guest that night. He lived in a Lee Su village on the Burmese side of the border. Being expected by him was not a guarantee of safety, but it was better than nothing. We walked in that afternoon with this little girl who lives on the Burmese side and her cattle. One time, my two guides stopped. They were pointing off into the forest. They asked Ron and I if we could see all the guys out there with the guns. Well, we looked into the jungle. We didn't see anybody, but they said, no, you can only see them when they're moving. When they're standing still, they're invisible because of what they wear. And he was right. You're looking at them right now, but you can't see them. This really scared Palm. He was now constantly glancing off to the Burmese side of the trail. Then we saw something that really scared all of us. It was a mountain keep out sign a crucified dog over the trail entrance to the first opium field. Its message was obvious, go back. But we had come a long way, so we walked around the corner and saw the golden triangle in bloom. It's amazing that something so beautiful can cause so much misery in the world. that we could feel free to take pictures because we were expected to do that. But they warned us not to take the wrong kind of pictures because we could be sure that we were being watched the whole time. They warned us not to take any panoramic shots that might give away this location. They also told us not to film the opium mercenaries with their guns, not to film the opium mule trains, and not to film the opium refining process. Three of those four rules we ended up breaking. There's Lee Su's little brother. He liked Ron so much, I think he wanted to adopt him, keep him here in the mountains as his new big brother. Yeah, it would be rare having a blonde big brother up here. The reason that it's so dangerous in January and February is that's harvest season. There's millions of dollars of opium growing here all year long, but you can't steal an opium field. It takes hundreds of people weeks to harvest it. Only in January and February is it harvested and loaded on mule trains. Well, you can steal a mule train. Here's how the harvest is accomplished. They make razor blade slices in that opium bulb, allowing the white sap to leak out. And they come back later and collect it. So obviously it takes a lot of people a long time to collect any amount of opium. This girl is in the Yao tribe, Y-A-O. You can tell because she's wearing a red fringe collar. Those are the colors of the Yao. After the sap has been out in the sun, it turns brown, loses most of its potency. So they do most of the harvesting early. Opium is not the only illegal drug grown here either. Right now you're standing under a 15 foot high marijuana forest. It was about this time I filmed something that I had been warned against, but I couldn't resist filming the first opium mule train that I saw. It was about 80 mules long, I filmed the first few. That package on this side of the mule contains that opium sap that we just saw. They're taking it to the village where we're going to spend the night. That's going to make this village a very dangerous place for us to be tonight. The danger is that the opium warlord on the other side of the hill might decide to attack tonight, try to steal the crop. If that happened, we'd be stuck right in the middle of a firefight in this village. Most of these Southeast Asian villages look very similar, whether they're the Mont Guards in Vietnam, Ifagaos in the Philippines are the Lee Sioux people here. Here's the opium refining process. 
He's refining a small test batch to see how potent the opium is going to be that will be coming in tonight. Thousands of times this much opium will be refined here tonight. It was about this time I remembered I wasn't supposed to be filming this, so I whipped my camera away at a spinning top on the ground. Two Lisu boys were playing a common mountain game, sort of like marbles. One boy will spin his top, the other one will try and hit it with his top. I thought that I had been quick and tricky enough with my camera work to go undetected, but the wrong guy saw me. He saw me. And then I remembered I wasn't supposed to film him either. Getting more and more into a jam here. What happened overnight in this hut made me realize how serious it had become. It was too dark to film, so I had to hire an artist to help me tell the story. Lee Su's wife was passing dinner out to everybody in small wooden bowls. Suddenly, a half a dozen mercenaries walked into the hut and started staring. As the sun went down, an eerie red light filled the hut. I got up and introduced myself to the mercenary sitting closest. Tom told me to be very respectful and give him anything he asked for because he was the head of the mercenary army in this sector. He didn't speak any English, but I could talk to him through my two guides. He could talk to Lee Su, Lee Su could talk to Palm, and Palm could talk to me. He broke the ice first. He pulled out a bottle of mountain whiskey and offered it to us. At first, Ron turned it down, but I told Ron that turning anything down would be an insult, so he accepted their gift and then did something that made me very happy I'd brought him along. He pulled out his bottle of Seagram 7 from the Chiang Mai Hotel, and everybody's eyes lit up. These guys rarely ever got a chance to try something like this. Well, in the next couple of hours, we drank every one of Ron's little bottles. Then something happened that really scared all of us. Our host now stood up, and in perfect English, he said, okay, we drank all of yours, now you not die. He had been merely pretending not to speak English to interrogate us. He told us to go to sleep, ordered his men outside, and posted an armed guard around our hut all night long. After he left, Palm started talking. He said that he thought that we were all going to be killed. And Ron said, why? We were no threat to them. And Palm said, well, at first he thought maybe that you were in the CIA or connected with the police. But after a while, he realized that you were just a couple of American tourists in the wrong place at the wrong time, which meant he still had to get rid of you because he might have a fight on his hands that night. This meant he had to either lock you up and protect you or kill you. But since you had become his honored guest, he was honored bound to protect you. I said, wait a minute, how did we become his honored guest? Palm started to answer, but about that time our guard stuck his head in the window and reminded us that we had been told to go to sleep. He didn't have the kind of face that we wanted to argue with, so we went to sleep. Early the next morning, the village was completely deserted. The people were out harvesting more opium and the mule train had gone down the hill. But the area around the village was on fire. It was probably very innocent, but we didn't stay around long enough to find out. We left with the first mule train that day. A normal mule train this time, no opium on board. And on the trail, Palm started talking. He said that we had been okay last night because of that exchange in liquor. When these people offered us that liquor, they offered us their best. These people will never offer you anything unless it's their best. If we had refused it, we'd have caused them to lose face. Basically saying that their best wasn't good enough for us, they probably would have killed us on the spot. But since we accepted their gift and offered them everything we had, we had become an honored guest. If anything had happened to us after that, the leader would have lost face in the eyes of his men, not being able to protect the guest. The saving of face is more important to these people than just about anything else. This is the same Aka village that we had visited three years earlier. Do you remember her smoking that pipe in the background? She's remembering us. We met her three years ago. It was amazing to me how the people could remember us here over the years. Jungle Johnny and Mr. Moo never made any deals with the Aka people because they lived too unsanitary a life. None of the tourists wanted to stay with them. Still, they do some of the finest wood carving and weaving in the mountains. The dogs up here are always trying to steal the show, but somehow they're always being upstaged by the pigs. Five miles further down the trail, we found a Yao tribe. Remember that I told you the Yao people wear red fringe? The children wear balls of red fringe on their headdresses. And the women wear red fringe collars and black turbans. Those are the colors of the Yao. <laughs> Ten miles further down the trail, we found a Chinese refugee camp. This was the first civilization that we had seen in about a week. Sort of like an old western town, wooden buildings and dirt roads. But they did have real beds, running water, and electricity here. Anytime you find the Chinese in the world, you find merchants, store owners, people selling things. 
This Aka tribe has come down here early this morning to acquire metal tools from the Chinese. Sometimes they buy the things that they want, sometimes they swap for what they want. And often they use opium in their transactions. Opium is a big part of the economy here. Many of these people become addicted to smoking opium at an early age and they maintain that addiction all their lives. Opium is not what they're smoking in this big water pipe though. This is the way that they smoke their tobacco and other herbs. There's water in the bottom of the bamboo to cool the smoke. Opium is usually smoked indoors in more seclusion. The smoker lies on her side and holds the opium pipe over an open flame and inhales. From opium we get the two drugs morphine and heroin. Morphine is an important medicinal drug, it's a painkiller. Heroin is a human nightmare. Well, I had problems of my own. As you can see, my package of film now is completely shot, which makes it worth its weight in gold to me, since I'm never going to want to come up here and do this again. But think about what I was trying to do. I was trying to take 50 sealed film cans all the way from the center of the Golden Triangle to Los Angeles, unopened. If any soldiers or customs agents wanted to search my film, they wouldn't have found any drugs, but they would have exposed the movie to the light and ruined it. So even though I wasn't a smuggler, we had to find the smuggler's route out. This meant avoiding the main roads where the soldiers would be searching luggage. We thought an elephant caravan might be an answer, so we went to a logging camp. Logging is still done by elephants in this part of the world. The mahouts are the men who work with the elephants. And the first thing that they do for their pachyderms in the morning is to give them this great back scratch to clean them off. Well, the elephants like the back scratch, but that's not their favorite part of the morning. The bath is. They all have their own way of bathing. Some like to stand up and shower themselves. Their mahouts will always cooperate. Well, after the bath is over, the workday has to begin. Teak is the wood that they bring out of these forests. Very hard wood, ideal for building furniture. Most of the teak in the world comes from these jungles in Southeast Asia. Very friendly, interesting place. We could have stayed here for days without becoming bored, but we had to get that film south. A British family arrived that day and hired a couple of elephants for a little caravan of their own. I told them about our problem and they suggested that we ride along on their elephant for about a half a day through the jungle to a mountain road where the mountain buses traveled. These mountain roads were much smaller, less traveled, there might not be any customs agents. So after about a half a day on the elephant, we climbed off onto a mountain bus and took off south. For a while it looked like we weren't going to have any trouble at all. The road was almost completely deserted until we pulled into the first village. Villagers climbed on to sell food to the passengers and a couple of soldiers climbed on to check everybody's luggage. When they got to me, I told them that my film belonged to Colonel Sun Chai, who was the head of tourism in this country. If they wanted to search my film, they better check with him first. Well, it was Sunday and they couldn't call him, so they got off the bus without searching me. They took my bluff. But when they left, they told me that there was no way we were going to make it all the way to Bangkok without being searched. These two guys just didn't want to accept the responsibility. Ron and I decided they were probably right, so we got off the bus and took to the Klongs. The reason that the Thais cannot really be held responsible for most of the opium that comes through their country is that very little of it's grown in Thailand. Most of it's grown over the border in Burma or Laos, while the Thais have no jurisdiction. And the opium that does come through Thailand often comes through on these klongs or in hay trucks. Well, no matter how big of an army or a police force you had, you could never possibly patrol the klongs of Thailand or search all the hay trucks. These klongs crisscross their way all over this country like some kind of giant spider web. Even the boatmen only know the klongs for a short distance around their house. That's because the old ones are always being swallowed by the jungle, new ones are being dug. Naturally, there are no signs, so you just have to know where you're going. Once we got out of the more populated area, the klong began to get narrower. I suggested that we go faster. We did have a long ways to go. My boatman said, oh, would you like to see what my water taxi could do? I said, yes. He told me to climb up on the front of the boat. It'd give me a good ride. Just about that time, we passed his personal little watt. He said a prayer and opened it up. Now, remember, we're on a five-foot wide waterway here that's only a couple of feet deep. We're on a boat that's almost 30 feet long, and at times, we're going to be going almost 30 miles an hour. It was sort of like sitting on the front of an arrow, 
and being shot down a water pipe. I could hear Ron and the boatman back there laughing at me. Ron kept saying, you getting good film up there, Rick? We were also sharing this waterway with oncoming traffic at that speed. And frequently, we had to duck. Fortunately, we only had to take that for a day. We transferred to a train heading south. We hadn't come too far south on the Klongs, but we had come far enough to the west to get out of the main opium route between Chiang Mai and Bangkok. Now we were sort of paralleling the Burmese border. Further south, I realized we were actually on the Death Railroad, the one that goes over the bridge and the River Kwai. Certain parts of that railroad are still in use today. It's easy to see how it got its name. Could you imagine trying to build a railroad in this kind of country under the gun of the Japanese, being plagued by malaria, dysentery, dengue fever? Later that afternoon, we crossed the bridge that still stands. If you saw that movie, you might remember that the Allies blew up the bridge the Japanese forced them to build here. That's true, we did. Then after the war, the Allies forced the Japanese POWs to build this one. Monks travel free in Thailand. Well, Ron took off for home from Bangkok, but I didn't think that would be my wisest move, not with my film during opium season. I knew that if I stayed on this train, it would continue down through Thailand, down the Malay Peninsula, through the country of Malaysia, to the little island of Singapore at the tip of the peninsula, a wiser place to fly home from at this time of year. But this was not a trip without danger of its own. There's been a history of train robberies along this route. A few years ago, the Thais and Malays decided that this had to end, so they started loading the trains with heavily armed soldiers, locking them and highballing it north or south all night long. Those robberies ended overnight. But you can bet that if they went back to the old ways, the robberies would probably begin again. Early the next morning, we had arrived at the border between Thailand and Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is Thailand's one friendly neighbor. But still, they do have a problem here with terrorists. So these guards were at the train station to guard the passengers. You see more and more of this kind of thing in the world of today. Once we transferred into Malaysia, I thought my problem with my film would be over, but that wasn't the truth. You see, Malaysia is a Muslim country. Muslim law is about the strictest law in the world of today. And when it comes to drugs, the laws in Malaysia are about the strictest anywhere. They were frequently executing people by guillotine for trafficking drugs, but we had to get that film south. We had to go all the way to the island of Singapore, then somehow fly at home. Now this meant we had to take the West Coast Road or the East Coast Road on the Malay Peninsula. Now the West Coast Road would be a very comfortable highway, but there would be customs agents everywhere checking luggage. The East Coast Road probably wouldn't have any customs agents because very few people travel there. To get to the East Coast Road, you have to cross the Northern Thai Malay Road. But the Thai Malay Road is dangerous. These are military outposts here to protect the road crews. They're time to finish building the road here. The problem is that the communist insurgents are constantly shooting at the road crews. In the most dangerous areas, there will be a military outpost like this every half mile or so, and there will be guards, heavily armed soldiers carrying their M16s, walking about every hundred yards. If somebody shoots, they shoot back. Needless to say that the traffic and the cab drivers here waste no time getting through this area. This trucker had his tires shot out. He immediately walked to the nearest military outpost and came back later with soldiers. Once we got to this rubber plantation, I knew the danger was over. The plantation would never have existed back in the dangerous area. Rubber is the only cash crop that the British were ever able to grow here. The soil in Malaysia is so poor that they can't even grow rice. But the rubber thrives, and so does the jungle itself. A self-sustaining ecological system in very poor soil. If they ever do deal with their political problems and open the east coast of the Malay Peninsula up, it will probably become a tourist paradise. There are miles and miles of white sand beaches here without a footprint. And the people who live around here live the old Malay way, the way that they have for hundreds of years. We're in the city of Malacca, Malacca, Malaysia. 
The fishermen are untangling their nets for the day's work. The things I saw in Malacca reminded me of scenes conjured from a Dickens novel. The whole place looked like an oil painting. These people work in a large city. They work in big office buildings, most of them, but this is how they arrive to work in the morning, on the water taxis. This is what old Singapore used to look like. They say that you used to be able to smell old Singapore when you were still two days out to sea if the wind was right. It was one of the filthy sin cities of Southeast Asia. That's right up until the Second World War. After that war, a Chinese man named Lee Kuan Yew took over here, and he managed to clean up old Singapore. His methods were brutal at times, but he managed to transform Singapore into one of the most modern and clean and safe cities in Southeast Asia. Old Singapore is hard to find anymore. It's being replaced by a very modern city. Everybody puts their laundry out the window on long wooden poles. They call these the international flags of Singapore. Well, my first trip here, I figured when in Singapore, I should do as the Singaporeans do. I no sooner got everything out the window there, though, and the floor manager knocked on my door. He said, Mr. Howard, this is not what we do in the hotels. It's only for the public housing. The aerial approach to Hong Kong is one of the most beautiful in the world. So the pilots will usually fly you all the way around the island before landing gives everybody a chance to see everything. When you land, you realize you've entered a very watery world, a world of boats. That little boat there is called a sandpan. These are the water taxis that transport people all over this area. They have so much water around here that they have more water taxis than the four-wheel kind. Victoria Harbor separates Hong Kong Island from the Kowloon Peninsula on top of Victoria Peak. You can get quite a view of the whole city from up here. Aberdeen Fishing Village. Aberdeen is a fascinating world within a world, an entire floating community. The people here live on these large junks, and the little sandpans provide transportation between them. Many of these junks go down fishing off the coast of Vietnam every year. They not only bring back fish, some of them bring back refugees, and some of them bring back opium from the Golden Triangle. The smuggling of opium is a big problem here. Quite a bit of it takes place through Aberdeen. That's because it would be virtually impossible to ever try to search these junks. I was looking out the window into the sunset and trying to imagine what part of this country had been the most impressive in the last five years. The exciting city life in Bangkok, classical dancers, or maybe it was the very affectionate relationship that existed between the Mahouts and their elephants up in the mountains. There was that time that we had to smuggle our film out of this country down the Klongs of Thailand. Beautiful undersea coral gardens of the south, and the way that they contrast with the tragically beautiful opium gardens in the north. And the way that the mountain people up here can somehow coexist with the opium war that rages through their country every year. They seem so unaffected by this that they could actually remember us over the years. That's what will make a place good or bad. The people will always inevitably be responsible. I think you'll agree that all the ties, kids, the pretty ladies, they've all made a very exciting place for us to visit. I'd like to thank you for visiting Thailand with me. Kap Kun. I'll see you next time.